Hello, today we're going to recreate a flight that took place on July 16, 1999, involving uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. departing Caldwell Airport in Essex County, New Jersey, en route to Martha's Vineyard. I did research on the flight, uh, although we're not flying the flight today in the same Piper Saratoga airplane, we are going to use the same navigation radios and fly the same route at the same time of day and time of year and uh, replicated weather conditions uh, that John F. Kennedy Jr. experienced on that day. This flight is not in any way intended to uh, criticize anything he may or may not have done on his flight, which did end in a airplane crash in the uh, water off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we are not going to be using autopilot today. I would point out that the Piper Saratoga that John F. Kennedy Jr. flew on that day uh, was capable of uh, two-axis autopilot and uh, altitude hold. Apparently he did not avail himself of the autopilot um, on that day. The airplane was also equipped with GPS. We will be using the GPS only insofar as the departure and destination airports. Um, I do have several VORs tuned in which uh, would have been used by John F. Kennedy Jr. on the flight that day. We're going to go ahead and bring Sky Vector up and show you the flight path and the VORs. So here's the departure airport at Essex County Airport and then flying northeast. First VOR waypoint is going to be at Bridgepoint, Bridgeport. The next VOR waypoint at Madison, that's Mike Alpha Delta. Then we have New London, Connecticut or Groton, which is Golf Oscar November and finally the VOR at Martha's Vineyard, which is depicted right here. Martha's Vineyard, MVY. Now, on the flight that night, uh, the weather conditions were VFR, although there was a lot of haze due to smog in the New York area. As it turns out, John F. Kennedy Jr., only um, his only communications with air traffic control was ground control and tower. Then he departed and flew underneath the Class Bravo airspace of Newark, uh, John F. Kennedy, and LaGuardia airports as depicted here. So he would have had to stay below 3,000 right here and fly underneath the Bravo airspace. And then he climbed to a cruise altitude of 5,500, which is an appropriate VFR uh, cruising altitude for an eastbound flight. And he maintained 5,500 feet until very shortly before Martha's Vineyard, where he began a descent and apparently lost control here due to spatial dis disorientation as a result of losing his reference to the horizon uh, due to the fact that it was uh, at night so uh, and also at night over the ocean as often is the case the the ocean itself merges with the sky and you don't have any uh, reference to the horizon it's as if you're in IMC conditions so we're going to replicate those conditions all the way into Martha's Vineyard. The only difference here is we're going to try to make a, uh, a safe approach and landing at, as was intended on that day, July 16, 1999, by John F. Kennedy Jr. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, hop inside the airplane and uh, we'll show you what frequencies we have tuned up here. This is the time of day that he departed. As you can see, it's getting dark. Uh, and we've got the ground control frequency right here, 121.9, and we have tower in standby. We are going to depart from runway 22, which is uh, based on the wind conditions from the southwest on the day in question. So here's runway 22, and here's our position. Okay, I'm going to listen to ASOS and uh, get our taxi clearance. Essex County Information Mike. Zero hundred Zulu weather. Wind two zero zero at seven. Visibility ten. Sky clear. Temperature three one. Dew point seven. Altimeter two nine nine zero. Arriving runway two two. Departing runway two two. Advise on initial contact. You have Mike. Okay. 
For 2 detail frequency 1, uh, correction, the ground frequency 1, 2, 1 1.9, we're going to go ahead and get our clearance. Let's bring up the map just to show you where we are on the airport. So there we are at Airbound Aviation FBO, and we're going to taxi over to runway 22. Coldwell Ground, Saratoga 9253 November at Airbound Aviation. Taxi with Mike for VFR departure to the northeast. Saratoga Niner 253 November, Cobalt Tower, taxi runway 22 via taxiway Tango Papa, cross runway 28. Taxi via taxi runway 22 via Tango Papa, cross runway 28. Saratoga Niner 253 November. Okay, here we go. Now this airport in Essex County is very busy and it's also located underneath the Bravo airspace for Newark, LaGuardia, John F. Kent Airport. So here we have our clearance to cross runway 28 to the threshold of runway 22. Seven clear for takeoff from way two two. Clear for takeoff from way two two. Sarah Turgan nine or two five three November. Okay, feed off the brakes. Full power. Instruments are in the green. Cars available before takeoff. There's speed indicators. Live looking for. Yes. 
eventually better climb out to 2,500 in standard at Bravo airspace. visual reference to the horizon, um, that will begin to deteriorate as it becomes darker, particularly when we get over ocean.
did, uh, he was flying under visual flight rules, VFR conditions. But he uh, apparently didn't anticipate the fact that he uh, would lose his reference to the horizon uh, during the flight. Now he was, the uh, Saratoga was equipped with a two-axis autopilot and uh, GPS. He did not use the autopilot during the flight, not sure why that is, but it, it was equipped with that and it did have a GPS. The uh, GPS that we've got programmed here is simply the destination, departure airports, and nothing more than that. We plan on navigating by VOR radio. So here's our first uh, navigation radio came alive. We're going to listen to, uh, let's see here, it should be COM1, we should be receiving it. But So there's the uh, radial, we're going to tune that in, we're just going to stay on that radial, uh, heading 090. Hold this heading right here and maintain that radio to radial to bridge port, which is um, essentially what JFK did. He was using his VOR navigation during this flight, so we're going to do the same thing. Now we still got a ways to go before we get out of the Bravo airspace. We're going to maintain 2,500 on our present heading. much uh, sooner. Uh, there was a two-hour delay. Um, his wife was uh, caught in traffic, was shopping, caught in traffic, which delayed his departure by a couple of hours. So the departure time uh, was actually 8.38 p.m. on July 16, 1999.
many, many times out of the uh, Essex County Airport and had flown into Martha's Vineyard several times as well. He apparently had very limited night flying experience. Which was certainly a factor on the plane. A couple of things I have to ask myself is if I had autopilot, or and this plane does, but I'm deliberately not flying autopilot because I'm trying to replicate his experience. Um, it is a head scratcher though when you're equipped with with autopilot including altitude hold. It didn't have altitude pre-select. It was able to hold whatever altitude it was flying at. And it would certainly hold, hold um, pitch and roll. As it was a two-axis autopilot, but he chose not to, for whatever reason, use that on that day. And additionally, a flight director offered to fly with him, knowing that he had limited night experience and, and also the fact that Martha's Vineyard often has limited visibility, particularly as it gets uh, toward the evening hours when the temperature dew point spread decreases and uh, sometimes fog forms around the island. But uh, JFK chose to fly without his instructor on board. All right, we're still under the Bravo shelf. Uh, coming up on Westchester County Airport, which should be visible off to the left right there. That's Westchester County. And that's LaGuardia right there, off the right wing. And Teterboro Airport behind that. said uh, Jeff G. Jr. did not make communication with air traffic control during his flight. Westchester County Airport is a class Delta that would have required him requesting, requesting a transition through their airspace. Airspace at Westchester is ground to 3,000. So we're going to fly around the Westchester airspace right to the uh, Long Island Sound, which you can see right here ahead of us. And then we're going to follow that coastline. And we're going to use our VORs, not necessarily flying direct radials, but we're going to use it as a reference for situational awareness.
right about the time we get uh, up the Sanford, Connecticut, we'll climb up to 5,500.
replicate what uh, JFK did. We're going to fly above that airspace, which goes from ground to 2,500. Again, not requiring any communication with ATC. And coming up on 4,000.
on. And run. That's to New York Nav 2 Radio. out over here where there's no lights it's very difficult to determine where the horizon begins and ends where the sky begins and ends the water kind of merges with it everything becomes one black mass and it was a moonless night the night that he flew contributing also to the difficulty the visibility uh, issues was the, the haze in the area I'm not exactly able to replicate that here.
lights to the right. That's Long Island and North Shore, and then uh, the South Shore here of uh, Connecticut on Long Island Sound. Again, looking out over the water where there's no reference to lights. It becomes really difficult to make out where that horizon is, if not impossible, so you're going to have to then rely solely on your instruments for spatial orientation. The only way they were able to determine uh, his flight path was through uh, primary radar returns, which ended just off the coast of Martha's Vineyard where they lost radar contact. And what the radar return showed was uh, indicative of a, what's referred to as a death spiral or rapid descent. And then when a pilot becomes disoriented, that situation, oftentimes when they see that they're losing altitude, the reaction is to pull back on the control wheel, thinking that's good, that that's going to decrease the rate of descent, put them back into a climb, but the problem is that the plane's in a turn, more often than not in a steep turn, and the more you pull back on the control wheel, the more it accelerates your, your, your descent rate, and uh, that's apparently what happened. The airplane was descending at a rate of about 5,000 feet when it struck the water. I'm doing this flight is because I got myself into very similar trouble and, and uh, could very easily have ended up um, with control flight into terrain the same way John F. Kennedy Jr. did. Um, had I not took a few deep breaths and started to focus on my instruments instead of on my own sense of what I thought was um, straight level flight. I probably would have ended up in the same situation as him were it not for all the training I had done in, a, in, my, in the flight simulator prior to that incident that I experienced. I probably had spent about 100 hours of flying um, with sole, solely with reference to instruments in, in Flight Simulator 2000, the Microsoft Flight Simulator 2000. And, um, I can confidently say that that's what, that's what saved my life in the situation that I was in. I don't believe that I relied only on my private pilot training, the very limited instrument reference training that you do as part of the private pilot uh, training. If I were relying solely on that, very likely would have ended up in a similar situation when I got into IMC. Right, so we still see we have reference to the south shore on, of Connecticut along the Long Island Sound there and the Long Island lights there off to our right.
Kilo Fox Oscar Kilo off the right wing there. out there that I can see both on the Connecticut and Long Island Sound. I'm starting to find myself really mostly just looking at my instruments. I think it would be kind of foolish to sort of to try to orient myself based on what I'm seeing down there. So I'm kind of already relying on my instruments, which is a good thing because then when I get out over the open water, I'm already kind of focused on them and settled in on the instruments. of interest is that JFK had broken his uh, ankle in a hang gliding accident. Um, he was in a cast, they removed the cast, and then he was kind of in a, in a boot where he could walk with the boot. The boot was removed from the flight. I don't think that that was a factor based on what I've read. He was able to manipulate the rudder pedals fine. So I, I don't attribute that cause or that to have been a cause for the, uh, the accident. I, everything points to spatial disorientation. I've made plenty of mistakes flying an airplane, 
and um, it's happened to me where I'll take off, you know, it's night, VFR conditions, but as you're pitched up on your climb out, you lose your reference again to the ground and to the lights that might be down there, that sort of thing. I've found myself thinking I'm straight level and I glance down at the attitude indicator only to find myself that I'm in like a 15, even sometimes 20 degree turn, left or right, and then I have to make a quick adjustment based on the attitude indicator. And even then I've found myself questioning whether the attitude indicator is accurate and then I reach over to fourth flight and get the AHARs to confirm what the attitude indicator is telling me. And uh, you know, sure enough, the, the instruments are right. And it was me that was totally wrong. And so, point being, any one of us can, can fall into that trap where we, we glance at an instrument and we're like, no, that can't be right. And, and only to you know confirm that it is right based on your what your heading indicator, your altimeter, and everything. All the other instruments are telling you to sort of cross-reference them to the attitude indicator, only to confirm, yeah, that the information coming from that atti attitude indicator is correct. Completely, you have to disregard what your sense is of what is uh, straight level flight. I've fallen into that trap, and that's one of the reasons it requires a lot of training, constant training. It's highly perishable. So yeah, that, that should be the Groton Airport there, uh, right off the nose, off the off the. Nose. There's, uh, that's pretty much it for, I think there might be one other smaller airport uh, between here and Martha's Vineyard. Let's see, that would be, I'm looking at the aeronautical section on Western State Airport, which is a non-controlled, non-towered airport. But that's pretty much it between, you know, from Groton over to Martha's Vineyard kind of out of airports. And not long after you pass Grand, you're kind of out of land. So you won't have those lights that we're seeing here. So you know, I can kind of use those. And I can probably fly okay using this visual reference. You know, because yeah, I can see this airport here. And feel pretty good about flying by visual flight rules, but even that's kind of limited. As soon as we get off the get away from the coastline here over the water, that's going to all change. Yeah, we probably have somewhere close to 20 miles to go before we get to that run VOR. following or 
the flight through the problem with clearance. Um, in his case, in hindsight, which is always 2020, it certainly would be better to have flight following in constant handoffs to ATC. At least you're talking to someone you can ask about weather uh, reports, pilot reports. They can advise you or warn you that the conditions are deteriorating at your destination. Any number of different advantages come from talking to ATC during your flight. We're obviously not doing that here. Because he didn't do it. Probably somewhere around 10 miles to go before we get to the ground VOR. Probably what we're seeing here is this looks like this is probably run and then that would be westerly state, which is not tower grounds class delta. And so after we get past uh, westerly state, I think we're out of airports. Uh, looking at the sectional, yeah, it looks like we're out of airports. New London information November. Zero hundred Zulu weather. Wind two zero zero at seven, visibility ten. Sky clear, temperature three one, two point seven, altimeter two nine nine zero. Yeah, so yeah, you can certainly you know, I do this when I fly, I'll, I'll tune into multiple different airports and I'm gonna be passing to their ASOS frequencies and, and listen in just to see what's going on weather wise, change my parametric. Setting in the altimeter as I fly. I'm not sure what he did on that day. I think when they found the airplane, uh, they discovered that he had he was tuned into the hatest frequency at Martha's Vineyard, but he was off by one digit. So he wouldn't have been getting the weather there. I don't know if that would have been a factor, but just one more thing.
we're flying flying over this uh, Delta airspace. We're well above the 2,600 feet ceiling for the Delta airspace there. Now let's see if we're going to switch over now to Mark this video see if we're getting it. Look like we're getting it. Looking over here. So we're just going to go right back to the Grand Pilar. And then we're going to fly that outbound. The CDI is getting real sensitive, so we're pretty close to the Eagle Station. So Navigation radios so we're just going to stick with the uh, MVY VOR at Martha's Vineyard all the way in. Now he got into trouble when he began descending from 5,500 for his approach into Martha's Vineyard. That's where that spatial disorientation took place. And eventually, it looked like the airplane descended, um, leveled off. 
temporarily and then went into a right turn and started to sink and then went into a rapid descent and then uh, struck the water a few miles off the coast of New York. I think he was pretty, pretty close to his destination when, when all of that happened. Now there's a couple options you know, to get into Martha's Vineyard. One of which keep could keep you over land. It might it's gonna take you pretty good ways out of your way. But you would you would go um, more to the north east up here. And you could pretty much stay over land all the way in just a very short crossing over the over the water. And he chose to fly a direct route over open water, which of course reduces your visibility. Vineyard information November. Okay. Zero hundred Zulu weather. Wind two zero zero at seven. Visibility ten. Sky clear. Temperature three one. Dew point seven. Altimeter two nine nine zero. Arriving runway one five. Departing runway one five. Advise on initial contact you have November. Okay, so we're gonna plan on coming in um, from the north from the. Uh this side of the airport. Martha's Vineyard information November. Zero hundred Zulu weather. Wind two zero zero at seven. Visibility ten. Sky clear. Temperature three one. Dew point seven. Altimeter two nine nine zero. Already, you try to imagine yourself flying 
forget about this over here. This wasn't here. We weren't seeing these lights down here. This is all you have. What's in front of us? And I wouldn't want to try flying that. And you can be right from a legal standpoint. Point. In other words, the reporting conditions are VFR and be technically correct with flying it under visual flight rules. That doesn't make it a good choice. That doesn't make it safe. It doesn't make it smart. As I well know from my own experience. So I've been pretty much, I've been, as I said earlier, I've been flying by instrument just instinctively. Um, not seeing much down there to make me want to fly visual flight rules. I think he was probably trying to do that. He had just begun instrument flight training apparently. Um, kind of an on off, on again, off again approach. So there was a lot of inconsistency there. I don't think he got to a point where he was comfortable with it. I mean, learning instruments is, is almost like learning a foreign language. You know, it just doesn't start to, initially it's, it's, it doesn't make much sense. And then all of a sudden it clicks and starts making sense. I don't know that he reached that point quite. And so it wasn't necessarily comfortable relying on the instruments. It kind of got him into trouble. And I know we've said this already and I mean, we've done a video on it, but if, if he had done as much simulator training as I did in instrument, I think it would have been fine. He'd have got in there okay. So that's it. That's all we have out there. It's just black sky going into black water. I mean, I can't tell where the horizon is at all. I mean, I see stars. Um, I'm not even sure he had that, but you know, I'm going to leave it where it is. And even where it is, I mean, there's, I mean, except for this little bit of land that I see out here to the left, looking straight out. I don't know how you would fly that unless you were looking at your attitude indicator, your, your heading indicator, altimeter. So to me right now, I'm, I'm a hundred percent IFR. There's nothing to look at out there that's going to help me fly this airplane. We're about 39 miles and uh, we're doing a pretty good speed over uh, in the 125-ish range. I'm just flying a little bit left here to capture that radio. This airplane's not really good at the lighting arena. Again, as I look out, I'm not sure he had that. What, what we see right here to the left, which is the remaining portion of Connecticut, um, I'm not sure he had even those visual references to the ground and to the horizon. Tower and I'll simulate that at about 10 miles out. 
we're expecting based on the ATIS on runway 15, which would put us in a right base for 15. And as I said earlier, he had landed at Martha's Vineyard before, so it was familiar to him. I don't know if he ever landed there at night. Something tells me he had not. Didn't have a lot of time night flying. Yeah, 
when I found, when I, when I was flying, when I was doing my private pilot training, because I was flying so many hours in the simulator instrument, my, my instructor actually had to tell me, hey, you need to look outside the airplane. You're flying VFR here. And, and so I, I started to, I developed some bad habits, I guess, of flying by instrument even when I was supposed to be flying by visual flight rules which is not a good thing when you're flying VFR. You want to certainly reference your instruments, of course, periodically, but not primarily. Now, on the flip side, when I got into trouble and got into IMC, uh, that became a plus for me because I was comfortable with it. And it, it kept me alive. It would have kept John F. Kennedy Jr. alive if, uh, if he had only forced himself to rely on those instruments. But as I've said, you know, sometimes you even have to, you have to talk yourself into believing what they're telling you. Sometimes it can be kind of a mental block to rely on. Because frankly, I mean, when you think about it, we spend most of our lives kind of on our feet, navigating by sight. And so your brain is just trained to rely on what you see to get you where you want to go, keep you upright. So you sort of have to untrain yourself of those natural tendencies when you're in an airplane. If you aren't able to fly by visual flight rules. And we're probably about 20 miles out. I'm just going to correct my course a little bit here as I fly this VOR. Now I'm assuming he was tuned into the Martha's Vineyard VOR, would make sense. I would have to confirm that by reading reports from the incident, but he was using VOR navigation, so it certainly would make sense that he was tuned to the... I'm just going to correct his speed. Correct my course here just a little bit. Let's see, let's see the there. Martha's Vineyard information, November. 0, 100 Zulu weather. Wind 200 at 7, visibility 10. Sky clear, temperature 31, 2.7. Altimeter 2990. Arriving runway 15, departing runway 15. Okay, no change. That tower frequency is set. We're just under 20 miles. 18.3 from the airport. The start of gentle descent here. Kind of a cruise descent. Airport elevation is only 67 feet, so we got some altitude to lose. Coming left. This is about where he got himself into trouble when he started his descent. And it could be, I'm theorizing this, that he may have had some better visual conditions at 5,500 and as he descended, that uh, degraded, potentially. And we're about 15 miles now.
tower. Saratoga 9253 November is 10 to the west. Landing with Mike. Saratoga 9253 November, Vineyard Tower. Plan on entering right base for runway 15. Plan on right base for runway 15, Saratoga 9253 November. Saratoga 9253 November, Vineyard Tower, Roger. Winds 
2207, cleared to land, runway 15. Cleared to land, runway 15, Saratoga Diner 25 through November. Again, still having a look at my instruments because there's really nothing out here to see. Kind of turn and look at the airport and uh, sort of line up with the runway. That's all well and good, but when you look out here, there's really nothing to see. And I always use my uh, heading indicator for as a, I kind of treat it like a moving map. I suspect that, that uh, you know, at this point you would have had the visual on the airport because the conditions, as I understand them, would have permitted that. It's just the problem was when you get out over open water, as that the uh, conditions were so poor that it was essentially equivalent to IMC flight. Your pathy reference glide slope to up here. Do it the old fashioned way. And final mountain collapse is set. So that's the, the flight that John F. Kennedy Jr. took out of uh, the airport in Essex County, uh, flying along the south shore of Connecticut, north shore of Long Island, along the Long Island Sound. 
He uh, flew underneath the Bravo airspace and then climbed to 5,500 continuing eastbound, eventually lost any reference to the land as he uh, left the south coast of Connecticut on the expanse of water between Martha's Vineyard and Connecticut. And then apparently as he was uh, approaching Martha's Vineyard and began his descent into Martha's Vineyard, um, became spatially disoriented and went into what's referred to as a death spiral. The plane became inverted and was descending at a rate of about 5,000 feet per minute when it made contact with the water. The airplane was found uh, some days later, recovered and brought into a hangar and uh, analyzed. It was uh, determined that there was no malfunction with the flight controls, avionics. So uh, it was determined that it was a spatial disorientation situation where the pilot was uh, trying to fly based on his own senses as opposed to the instruments. And uh, just to show you how easily that can happen, we replicated that flight over the water in VFR conditions and we really couldn't see the horizon and couldn't fly the airplane solely by reference to terrain below us and the horizon. Had to rely on instruments on this flight to bring it into Martha's Vineyard safely today. So that was, uh, a replication of the flight in a different type of airplane, but the conditions were the same. Uh, again, that was July 16th, 1999. The flight began at 8.38 p.m. Um, and ended uh, just over an hour later off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. Thanks for joining me today uh, on this flight, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.